brokenness is when you're getting high and secretly hope that if you do too much, you won't wake up. It's believing God can never hear your prayers because of how unworthy you are. It's an intense desire to act out in sexually immoral ways or to look at inappropriate images online or in other places. Feeling that I was unloved and never good enough, causing me to seek love in other places. It's turning to images that fill that emptiness of not being loved and feeling as it's the only thing that can make you feel complete. It's watching yourself make poor decisions when you really have no choice. I've been freed from drugs and alcohol. I found freedom through a personal relationship with God, AA, and community. I've been freed from the illusion that I have it all together now, that in my own strength somehow I have control or can manage my life. From the illusion that I don't have to seek love, but that Christ already loves me through what he did my old habits that told me this is what love is. I have found freedom from embracing those poor decisions and drinking as my identity. I have found freedom in my identity with Christ. Hey man, I love that last phrase uh, that Kate says there about finding freedom in our identity and Christ. And this morning we're starting a new series called Living Free. And if you, the video kind of helps you kind of get a picture of what we're looking at. Um, what's really happened uh, over the last few months is Lewis and I, who's the director of our Celebrate Recovery Program, uh, we've spent a lot of time just talking through um, what it looks like to actually live free um, from some of the things that are controlling aspects of our lives. Some of the things that are really, uh, that, we're, that are hanging on to us. We're not really even hanging on to them, but they're kind of hanging on to us. And what does it look like to live free? And the more that Lewis and I would talk, the more I kept thinking, you know, this isn't uh, stuff that just a handful of people hidden away on a Monday night need to hear. You know, this isn't stuff uh, living free from things that are kind of keeping us in bondage or, or controlling parts of our lives. Or it's not something that just maybe a little percentage of people who maybe have some big, massive, you know, problem. There's a needle in their arm and maybe they need to go to kind of some program and they really need help. But for the rest of us, you know, we have kind of more manageable problems and we're going to be okay. And the more we talked about it, the more we talked through kind of what it looks like to find freedom in Christ and to apply the gospel to every part of our lives, the more we realize, man, this is something for all of us something for us, something for our church family. And so what we want to do over the next eight weeks is we want to talk through in very practical ways, what does it look like to live free? Now, I just want to be honest with you, um, just up front, I didn't, we didn't uh, just come up with this material. We're not, you know, we're, we're smart. Lewis is real smart. He has like letters in front of his name. Um, and, but we're not the ones who like wrote the material. So there's actually a book here written by Rick Warren that we're kind of working through over these next eight weeks. Uh, it's very helpful. It's a study. It's an inductive study, actually. You work your way through it. Um, it's got questions and scriptures and things to fill in. And it's called Life's Healing Choices. And I would recommend if you want to go grab this, you want to take a picture of it. Miss Cheryl took a picture of it, uh, so she could go get it herself. And we're going to be working through some of that content over these next eight weeks. And the video kind of highlights what's going to happen over these next few weeks is you're also going to hear stories. You're going to hear stories from people in our own family from ways that God has helped them intentionally walk into more freedom. Now, here's the thing we all need to know. We're going to walk into more freedom, but on this side of heaven, we're always going to battle with sin. We're always going to battle with our flesh. So we don't have like a silver bullet here, okay? If you're here this morning, I don't have like the magic thing that's going to happen, and you'll never have temptation again. That's not possible. 
It's not like today, as we talk about these things, that if you're going to walk in this next six weeks, all your problems or my problems are going to go away. I think we all know that, but I think it's important to say that, that we're on a journey, that we're going to walk into more and more freedom as we submit more and more of our lives to Christ and allow the gospel to invade every part of our heart. And that's what we want to do in this series. So the question I've been thinking through this is, who is this for? I mean, if it's really for everyone, then let's get down, like, who is it really for? If it's for us, why is it for us? And I I was just thinking through some of the different people it's for, right? Uh, It's for people with wounds. Anybody in the house this morning got a wound, like got a hurt, a relational hurt, maybe even a physical hurt, but you have a, a wound, and it's a wound from something that was said to you maybe many, many times over a series or a part of your life. Maybe it's a relational break that happened, but you have a wound. Maybe here this morning, there's something in your life that's a habit. I mean, you know, you may even go like, well, it's not even that bad of a habit, but then when you add up all the hours that are given to that habit, you go, you know, it could be that there is something in my life that has more control over me than Jesus does. Right? Sometimes habits aren't all bad until they consume nine hours of your day. And there's a study out there about men between the ages of 18 and 40 and the amount of hours they play video games. Is video games a sin? No. Is giving eight hours of your life to a game as opposed to getting up and making an impact on the planet because you follow Jesus a sin? Absolutely. So you may have to look at our lives and go, do I have any controlling habits in my life, right? Maybe there are people in the house um, who struggle with paralyzing anxiety or paralyzing depression. Maybe maybe that's you in the house and, and you've struggled to actually do the things you know you're called to do and to walk in the freedom you have and to impact the people God has asked you to impact because anxiety keeps crippling you. And depression keeps slowing you down, and you begin to think, man, I I just don't have the energy to do the things that I want to do, and I don't have the strength to do it, and there's just not enough time in the day, and there is enough time in the day, but, but depression has a way of stealing time from us. And so maybe you're battling with anxiety or depression. You know, I'm looking at my notes on my hand here. Um, you know, maybe some of us have an unhealthy relationship with food. And and maybe you're like, I don't have a problem, but just consistently over time, your relationship with food is unhealthy. And and, and you're not happy with that. You're not happy with the way it impacts you. And and you know that from an emotional place, you go to it. And it's not honoring to God. Is food wrong? No, there's nothing wrong with food. Is, Is cheesecake wrong? Absolutely not. Right? But can we have unhealthy relationships with our food? Maybe there are some people in the house and maybe there's a substance abuse going on. And maybe if someone to ask you, you'd say, oh, I don't have a problem and everything's fine. But if you add it up how much and how often, you might go, hey, I struggle here. Maybe you have a substance abuse issue. You know, there's some people in the house and I think this is some of my own journey. Um, Maybe you have a body image issue. I remember one time when I was in high school, my aunt was home to visit, and she said, Chuck, you need to stop worrying about how short you are. I said, I'm not worried about that. She said, then why are you always willing to fight somebody every time they say something about it? See, so your reactions to things tell you what's really going on, right? Maybe you're the kind of person who has to check your weight on the scale every single day. Maybe every single day, and maybe your mood of the day goes up and down based on what the number of the scale says. Is that something that you don't have freedom in, right? Maybe there's some people in the house this morning uh, that are battling with sexual addiction, and I'm going to really talk about pornography because there are lots of sexual addiction, but come on, let's just be honest in our culture. Pornography is winning the day. I mean, the stats about pornography are mind-blowing, Men and women, not just men, men and women are looking at images that completely, completely destroy or try to smear the image of God on women. Completely make them objects of obsession. And yet, 
the numbers are staggering. Once a month, at least three out of four people look at it. Daily, three out of 10 people. And here's the staggering thing, about 90% of eight to 16 year olds have viewed online pornography. It's destroying us and it's destroying our soul. And yet it would be not probably uncommon. In fact, in all my pastoral ministry, virtually almost every guy I've any got really, really gotten to know, this is a real battle, a real struggle in their life. And is that just okay? Are we just supposed to step back and say, oh, that's fine, that's normal. That's what every person is doing. That's just the way the culture is going. That's just gonna be the norm of all of it. We don't, we're not expected to live free in those areas of our life. Come on, that's, isn't that a pipe dream? That we could expect our men and women to, to think honorably about one another and not to be buying into just a sewer of how we view one another? and how we think about our sex lives? Is that just a pipe dream, or are we just in the culture and this, that's just gonna be our story? And I think God would, would challenge us and he would say, hey, you can live free. Jesus did actually come and walk the planet and die on the cross, and he does put his Holy Spirit inside of people who trust in him, and when the God who spoke the earth and the world into existence lives inside of us, he isn't content with letting parts of our lives be controlled by other things. And so we want to ask the question, how do we live free? So this morning, that the first thing we're gonna look at intentionally is to admitting our need. Admitting our need. Now I think there are four barriers to actually admitting that we need help. There are four barriers that for us to come out of the closet, so to speak, and to say, here I am. Do you see me fully the way I am with all the things that are here? Do you see me? Do you know me? You know, we said a few weeks ago, a while ago, it's one of my favorite quotes, that one of the longings of the human heart is to be fully known and yet fully loved. And I think even in my own heart, I was battling with this. Can I be fully known and still fully loved? How much can I really be known as? How much can really be out there and yet still be fully loved? I think we're all battling with that question. Can I be fully known and fully loved? And I want to say that because we believe in the gospel, because we are a gospel people and a Jesus people, we are going to fight the battle of saying, please, I want you to let me know who you really are and you will still be fully loved. We have a statement on our website. It says, we refuse to be shocked or turned away by each other's brokenness. We're going to need to practice that. We're going to need to practice that with one another in this season of challenging us to come into the light in some areas of our lives that we're embarrassed about. Are we going to come into the light? And when we do, are we going to practice what we believe? I refuse to be phased. I refuse to go, oh, wow, oh my gosh, when you show me something in your life that isn't being submitted to Christ. Will you be able to walk with me and will I be able to walk with you is the question I think many of us are gonna be asking this whole time. So so how do we admit our need? I think there are four barriers to admitting our need. The first barrier is shame. Shame. Because shame, the shame of what we're struggling with pushes us into the darkness. It, it, It makes us hide. We don't want to be seen, so we either we cover it up or we avoid. Listen, I'm not that old, but I've been around long enough to know that if you avoid me, that means I'm texting you, hey, how are you doing? Are you coming to small group? Hey, where have you been? I haven't seen you in a while. And you avoid my call, you avoid my text, you keep canceling coffee on me. Hey, I'm smart enough to know that there's probably some shame, there's something going on that you're saying, hey, I don't want to be seen. And I have a problem with asking real personal questions. So I know what people are doing. They just don't want to be asked the personal question. Right? And so what do they do? They get an orbit around me. Right? They begin to pull away from any kind of community where real questions can be asked. Withdrawing, hiding, isolating. That's what shame does in our life. When we feel that shame, it comes coming in on us and it pushes us in to hiding. I want to show you this in Genesis chapter 2. Check this out. 
Genesis chapter 2 ends, creation, the story of creation ends, the shock and awe of the power of God in creation ends with this amazing climax of God making men and women in his image, in his likeness, a, a mirror that just echoes out the beauty of God over all the planet. He says, I made them in my image, I want them to multiply. Why? Because he wants little icons of his image all over the planet. He wants every corner of the planet to be covered with little image bears of people that when you look at them, you're shocked. It's amazing. When I travel the world and you see skin colors and mixtures of skin colors and hair things, and, and you're like, wow, this amazing uh, image of God on people. That's why God did it. It was to send his glory everywhere. And everywhere you looked, if you looked up at the sky, you saw his glory. If you looked down at people, you saw his glory. If a new baby was born into the earth and, and they were just a little bit different than the last one, you were like, wow, the beauty of God and the glory of God, the image of God. And it puts them together in marriage and it says something beautiful. Verse 24 of chapter two, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall be one flesh. And this man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. That's how the creation story ends. God built an amazing world, people in his image, put them together in a family, and then says over all of it, they were naked. They were fully known. Nothing hidden and unashamed, totally unashamed. And then in verse three, the story shifts. And the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field than the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, did God actually say to you, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the tree in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. That's right, lie against God, question whether we should trust God. That's the way sin always starts. God isn't good, God isn't right. There's no way God's word is true. Question it, that's the first step into bondage and slavery. Question the goodness of God. Question the truth of God's word. That's how it always starts. For God knows, the serpent says, that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. And when the eyes of both were open and they knew, what they know? They knew they were what? Naked. And what should you attach to that if you're a literary person? What's connected to the idea of being naked for the writer here. Shame. When they were naked, they were what? They were unashamed. When all of a sudden they're naked and they know it, which means they know shame. And look what they do when they know shame. They sewed fig leaves together and they made themselves loincloths and then they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife did what? They hid themselves. That's what we do when we're in shame. When we're in shame, we hide. So if we're going to say, hey, the first step of walking into allowing parts of our heart to be invaded by the truth of the gospel, invaded by the power of the Spirit of God... We've got to understand that shame pushes us into hiding. Now, the beautiful thing about that story is Jesus doesn't, uh, he knows exactly where they are. So go hide. He sees you. Go run. He knows where you are. He knows where they are. He knows what's going on. He calls out to them. He calls them. He gathers them. And even early in the story, he has a solution for their shame. He covers it. He takes an innocent animal and he slaughters the innocent animal. And takes the innocent covering, the skins of the animal, and he puts it over them and covers them. 
That's what he does. But shame is a barrier. You know, I think the second barrier is our pride. So we know it's wrong. We, we know we have something we don't like. We know there's something going on that doesn't honor God. We know that there's rebellion in our heart. We know there are things we have given ourselves to, but we've got pride. Someone says, hey, you know, maybe it's even come out. Maybe we've been embarrassed somewhere or somehow it leaked out somewhere. Someone got a picture of it. They're like, hey, I can help you with that. Or hey, you know about that. Or maybe we were just so desperate one time, we let it slip out to somebody. And then they had where they were like, well, cool, let's go do this together. And we were like, no, 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 I got a plan. I got it. I can handle it. I can figure it out. I can solve it. I can outthink it. I've had friends like that. I've been that person. I, if I just think hard enough, I'll figure this out. Like, I'm smart. I'll figure out the solution. And you know, all the other ones won't work. I was talking to a drug addict one time. He was staying at my house. He came and and I was like, all right, let's walk through these things. And, and he's like, ah, you know what, man? I, I know I can, fig- I can do this. Here are my drugs. And he handed me a whole bag of drugs. And he was like, I, I, I know I can do this. I, 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 know, I know rehab won't work for me. I, I know that I'm not going to go to a 12-step program. Yeah, that's for other people not as smart as me. I can do this. I can figure it out. And he thought his big gesture was that he handed me the drugs. As if I didn't know that he can get those, again, somewhere else. Right? But I think pride kind of comes in. And, and here's the thing. Pride can come in at the sneakiest places and about the things that even outsiders look in and go, sure, you can handle that. You got that? Come on, you can, I know you can do it. The problem is no one looking in knows how really strong you are about that issue. And what to them means no big deal. Yeah, of course, just decide you're never gonna go that way. Just decide you're not gonna give in to that. Just decide you're not gonna open up the computer to other people looking in. They're like, of course, because I can say no to that. But the problem is I'm not in your skin and I don't know your weakness. And you're not in mine, and you don't know mine either. If I tell you I'm struggling in an area, and then I quickly go, but I got it, you probably need to press into that a little bit. Because there's a chance that though it may not be a problem for you, it's a problem for me. And I may not be able to just snap my fingers and say no in that area of weakness in my life. But pride kind of says, I got it. I can handle it. You know, James chapter four says, and I don't have it on the screen, but it says that God opposes the proud. He opposes the proud. That means you are in rebellion against God when you say, I can do it in my own strength. I got it. You put yourself in rebellion, in opposition to God himself. And it doesn't matter what the issue is. Hang on to your pride, you're in rebellion against God. But what does he do? He gives grace to the humble. So he, has, he is in opposition against the proud, and he gives grace to the humble. The third thing, I think, is we accept it or we just embrace it. We just embrace it. I was having a conversation not long ago with somebody who was just like, hey, I don't see what the problem is. Like, I don't see. I, it's no problem. I'm not cheating on my wife. I'm not, I'm not you know, I'm, not, I'm faithful. I come home. I don't see what the issue is. I said, man, you know, you're talking to a guy who's like, I'm a pastor. I mean, like, no, it's fine. It's totally fine. It's totally accepted. It's fine. It's good. I embrace it. I love it. It's good. I love myself. I do what I want. Romans 1 has something to say about that in any area of sin. It says that the wrath of God is being poured out on people who say it's fine. And not only is it fine, but it's good for them too. So not only do they say it's fine, it's good, it's okay. It says they approve of other people who do it. Go for it. And it says the wrath of God is against that kind of, because what it is, it's setting yourself up as God. I am God and I can decide that it is okay. And I embrace it fully. And you don't have to run to big name sins. Just look at the one you don't want to let go of the one you're okay with, the one that's a part of your daily life and it's been that way for so long that you're really fine. And it leaks out when people talk about it. It's really fine. Why? Because I make my own choices. I do what I want. It's okay for me. You do what you want. Don't judge me. I do me. Right? 
And God said, there's, there's a wrath of God toward that kind of mentality. So we have shame, pride, the embracing of it. And then I think the last thing is, is we don't have a very full understanding of sin and the effects of sin on the world. In other words, we have a very shallow, when we look at things like this, we just think it's down to basically making choices. I make good choices and bad choices. I say yes to God's word. I say no to God's word. And then we kind of try to boil all of life into this thin understanding of like, hey, you know, I say yes to Jesus or I say no to Jesus. I obey or I disobey. And so we have a really thin understanding of the way sin is working in our heart and the way sin is working in my physical body and the way sin is working actually in the world around me. And if you go back to Genesis, you know the story, but if you look at this, what happens? How does sin begin to affect the world? Look how how much fuller it is, more than just the choices people make, but look what has happened to the universe because of our rebellion. Look at verse 13, the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you've done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And the Lord said to the serpent, because you've done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and above all the beasts of the field and on your belly you should go and the dust you shall eat all the days of your life. So the animals are cursed. You live on a planet where every animal is cursed. Every animal on the planet is cursed. To the woman he said, I shall multiply your pain in childbirth. So there's physical pain that has come because of human rebellion, and you shall in pain bear children, and your desire shall be for your husband. So now all relationships are affected by human rebellion, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, because you've listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded, that you should not eat it. Cursed is the ground that you stand on because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the day of your life. It will be work thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you and you shall eat the plants of the field the universe and sin is not just this thin i say yes to jesus or no to jesus i obey or i disobey the 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 effects of sin on our lives are broad and deep which means that we need a gospel that can handle my personal rebellion i personally say no to god in that area of my life god no I I, I won't. We need a a gospel that handles that. But we also need a gospel that happens when sin has been done against us. We've all been the victims of someone else's sin against us. And, And here's the crazy thing about that. You will still experience shame from sin done against you. There are many, many people walking the planet whose shame weight is from the sin of someone else toward them, against them, and the humiliation they feel from it, how stupid they feel about it, how worthless they feel because someone could treat them that way and they were still there and maybe didn't do whatever they could have done or whatever. There's so much shame in the world and and if you boiled it down, you'd go, man, it wasn't even my own sin. It was the sin of the world against me. And then some of us are battling, I mean, just in our own body. Like, here's the reality. If our bodies are in a broken world, if we're born into a broken world and our bodies have a time clock, which means we're born and we're on a journey to being at the end where this body, this shell dies, if that's true, then sin would affect how I feel about myself, wouldn't it? It would, it would, it would make me more confused sometimes about myself. It, it, it would maybe, it maybe have something, some things going on with it that would make me go, man, I don't think that's the way it's supposed to be, or I don't know if that's, you know, I got a crooked arm. I don't know if you knew that. I have a crooked arm. I really do have a crooked arm. And, you know, there was, a long, there, there, there was a time I didn't notice it at all, and then somebody pointed it out, and then when they pointed it out, I was super self-conscious about it. Right? And it's not perfect. It's not right. See, if we're broken people and we, we live in a broken universe, then sin should have been into effect it will affect that. So, so is anxiety a sin? No. But does anxiety have connections to my physical body and, my, and, and the things going on in my brain and, and dopamine levels and the way things fire? Oh, yeah. Should we expect all that to be broken because of sin? Absolutely. So what gospel do I have for that? 
What gospel do I have when I struggled with depression, but I can't think of anything I've done wrong or anything I should change in my life, and I can't think of anything that's done against me, but I just, I'm still depressed, I'm struggling. What, what do I do about that? Well, couldn't it be that we live in a broken world and I have a broken body, and it, couldn't it be that the sinful world is affecting that? And don't I need a gospel for that too? I need a gospel for all of it. I need a gospel for my own personal rebellion. I'm rebelling against God to do what I want. And I need a gospel for that. I also need a gospel for the sin done against me. I, 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 need, I need the power of Jesus to be able to come in and free me from the shame of the sin that was done to me and against me. But I also need a gospel and I need to live in the rhythms. We, all, we talk about the rhythms of the gospel. I need to live in the rhythms of the gospel for just the basic brokenness of my human frailty. A body that's breaking down. A brain that doesn't work the way it should. Emotions that are connected to my brain chemistry that aren't quite firing like the way they ought to. I need a gospel for that too. I need a gospel for all of it. And that's who this series is for. If those are the barriers to admitting our need, what are some of the unique tools God uses to get us to a place to admit our need? The first one is he uses his word. If you faithfully go to God's word, you're gonna find that God's word faithfully, consistently pushes you to admit your need. It consistently reminds you that things are not the way they should be. It consistently reminds you that you're more broken than you think. It consistently reminds you that you need the help of God to move in your direction. Go to God's word and it'll tell you again and again and again. Oh, would you be gathered to God and would he heal your broken places? God's word does a great job at breaking through the barriers of meeting our need. The second thing is the people of God. See, the people of God are beautiful because they see. They're smart. So if you're around them, you don't, you could just, just be quiet. Just be around them. And they're going to see you. They're going to watch. And you need them to. And we need each other to see one another. And then, and then they're there because they're good listeners. You guys are great listeners. Some of the, my, my favorite people in this room that I get to share my heart with. But why? Because you're good listeners and I'm a good talker. It's a great relationship. And, and, and so the people of God are going to listen. Justin's laughing because we always sit and hang out for hours and I do like 90% of the talking and Justin listens. And then I ask him a question. How's your life going? No. <laughs> but, but, but the people of God, they see you and then they listen. And then, and then they walk with you. And they pray for you. Oh, don't discount that. Don't discount the power of the people of God knowing exactly where you struggle and praying for you. Knowing that unique place and that need, unique space in your life where you need them and they pray for you. Man, what a beautiful thing, the, the word of God and the people of God. And then the, the third thing is, is God uses pain. See, see pain has this way of working in our lives. See, you know, C.S. Lewis says that, uh, that God whispers this to us in our pleasures. Like you're experiencing something beautiful in life, amazing things, and you hear the whisper of God, you're in that, wow, that's beautiful. But he shouts to us in our pain. Because our pain is a thing, we, we, wanna, we wanna get rid of that, right? So, so the pain comes in, and the pain, when, when we're in pain, we go, we don't, we, our, our ability to hang on to our pride is really hard. You ever try to hang on to pride when you're really suffering? It's hard. Well, I'm strong. I can't get out of bed. It's tough. Oh, man, I can handle it, except I can't seem to maintain one good relationship. It's hard to hang on to your pride when, when you're hurting, right? And, and, and so it makes, you, it makes you realize you're weak, uh, and, and sometimes pain makes you realize you're wrong. Like some of the relational like, growth that I've had in my life just comes from like messing up, saying the wrong thing, hurting someone's feelings, and experiencing the backlash of relational pain to go, oh, hey, don't talk to people that way anymore. Don't, don't do that. Pain has a way of, of saying, hey, you know, maybe that direction is the wrong direction. Maybe that's, maybe that's not the way you want to keep Walking, God has a way of speaking to our lives uh, through pain. And, and sometimes because we, 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 we dislike pain so much, 
We're, we're made that way, actually. We're, we're made to desire pleasure and reject pain. Um, that when we have pain in our lives, that it, it begins to shape our wants. Do I really want this if it continues to produce pain? Do I really want to go to this again when it continues to ruin things in my family? Do I really want to go to this again when, it, when I see the impact of that on my children? Do I really want to go to this again when it just seems like I, 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 it's hurting everybody around me and it's hurting my own life? So it, it begins to change our want tos. Makes us feel weak. Makes us evaluate our direction and then whether we want to. And, and so these are powerful tools of God. There's this passage in Psalms. I want to show you this, Psalms 119. Look how David talks about this. Psalms 119, verse 65. Here's what David says. He says, you have dwelt well with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I believe in your commandments. That's a good place to start. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. What's David saying? David was saying that there was a direction he was going, and then he seems to attribute to God that God brought some affliction in his life. I want to say that with some tenderness because pain is pain, and it hurts. And so to attribute that, the, that, that God would bring some kind of pain into my life that would have a, a, a way to reorientate my direction that can be hard to handle. That he could bring pain into my life to, to carve out pride. That he could be pain into my life to carve out self-centeredness. That he could bring pain into my life to carve out codependence. That he could do that is sometimes a hard idea. And yet a loving God can bring pain into our lives. And he says, before I was afflicted, I went astray, he says. But now I keep your word. You are good and you do good. So he is a good God. Notice how he combines that. I was afflicted. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but I was afflicted. Now I keep your word. Now, what do I think about that? God, you're good. God, you're good. How are you good? Because I went astray and you afflicted me. I was in my own path doing what I wanted and you brought pain into my life that reorientated my direction. Wow, you're good. You're a good God. Thank you for that. Thank you that you would work things in my life to root out idols in my heart. Man, we need that. There are some idols in your heart that will not come out unless God applies pressure. They are rooted so deep. We've created such an identity around them that unless God comes smashing at it with pain, We'll never get to it. In fact, some ways, and some of these idols in my heart didn't even know they were there. That's a big wake up call. Like, wow, that's an idol? Man, it took me 30 years of like suffering to figure out that that has been the thing I've been living for. I had some wake up calls like that this year. Things rooted deep, deep down. But God uses affliction and he uses pain to kind of begin to root it out of our heart. That's what David says. Look how he finishes this. The insolent smear me with, smear, uh, smear me with lies, but with my whole heart I keep your precepts. Their heart is unfeeling like fat, but I delight in your law. It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. It was good for me. It was good for me that you brought this into my life so that I would learn your law, learn your ways. The statutes and the commandments of God are the ways of God. They're not just the rules. We need to be careful about that. When we look at the word of God and the commands of God, we're not looking for the playbook. We're not looking for the list of things. We're looking at the mind and the ways of God. How does God care about these things? How does God care about the way we talk and treat and love one another? That's his statutes. That's his word. That's his commandments. We're looking into the heart of God himself. So he says, you afflicted me so that I would know your ways and your statutes. So God uses these things. He uses his word. He uses his people. And he uses pain. The, uh, the last thing I'll, I want to say here is then if these are true, if we have these barriers to living free, and the way God 
works in us many times, the tools that he works in us to get us to a place where we admit we have a need is his word, his people, and pain, then the question is, how do we respond to that? How do we respond to what God is saying through his word? Like right now, if if God's word is saying something to you, then, then how do you respond to that? What's the proper response to God's word crashing in and saying, I want that, that, that piece right there, that spot, I want it. How do we respond to that? How do we we give in when godly people in our lives put an arm around our shoulders and say, brother and sister, you know, I love you deeply, but I just, I want all that God has for you. And I just, you know how they normally say, would would you pray about this? Because maybe I'm wrong. That's how, because we're, we're so defensive. Right? So, so, so how do we respond when a brother and sister sees and hears and speaks truth? What, what, what do we do when pain is coming into our lives in an area? Do we just blow it off? What, what's the way forward? And I think that Jesus shows us the way forward in Matthew 5. And I'm almost done. Matthew 5. This is the Sermon on the Mount. Check out what Jesus says in verse 3. He said, blessed It's the goodness of God and the blessing of God toward people. Blessed are, what, the poor in spirit. It's the the person who's broken in their spirit. Not not proud in spirit, not not controlling in their spirit, not strong in their spirit, but, but poor, broken in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn. And I think the context is going to tell us not just, not just basic mourning, but, but, but mourning, mourning over life and the hurt and pain and the suffering of life. For they, they mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And blessed are those who what? Who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled or satisfied. What's the way forward when God's word and God's people and the pain of life has revealed to us that we need to admit our need? What's the way forward? What what should happen first underneath the surface is a hunger for the way of God, for a hunger for his righteousness, for a hunger for the wholeness he provides, a desire for him and his way to clothe our lives. And what he says, how does that come to people? Who are the kinds of people that have a hunger for the righteousness of God? They're generally the ones who are poor in spirit. They're generally the ones that are mourning. They've just got to a place where they go, God, I just like, I just need you. I'm weak. I don't know the way forward. I just need you. I want you. I want the wholeness you provide. Move in my direction. The meek. These are the ones that, that God seems to be stirring it in to have a hunger and a thirst for God. And what's the promise of God to those who hunger for God? He feels. He satisfies. And that's beautiful because everything else we chase, we chase it out of the, the promise that it might satisfy. And, and, and this, is, this is why... This is why guys tunnel in porn for hours on end. Because there's the promise of satisfaction. And then they have to tunnel and tunnel and tunnel and tunnel and tunnel because it never satisfies the way it promises to. And then, well, maybe that's not your thing, but maybe it's something else. And so you tunnel, and you seek, and you find, you God, I want to be satisfied. Would it satisfy me? It's got to hit that wound. Somehow it's got to meet that need. And God's saying, hey, there's only one thing that really fills. It's hunger and thirst for me and my righteousness. And who are the people who do that? The poor in spirit, the mourners, the meek. We have to have a, a hunger for the righteousness of God. And then the last thing, and I'm gonna go back to Psalms. I'll close with this. The last thing is we have to speak up. We can't be silent. We can't be silent. Look what David says in Psalms 32. He says, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven 
whose sin is covered. Praise God. Blessed is everyone who stands before God and knows that God has forgiven them and clothes them and accepts them and embraces them and loves them. Wow, no bigger blessing exists on the planet than to know that I am embraced by God and forgiven. Blessed is the man whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. I love those two things, forgiven and covered. Forgiven, but what's covered? Shame is covered. Yeah, you're forgiven. Guess what? You're forgiven. Oh, I know I'm forgiven, but I still can't tell anybody about that. I know I'm forgiven, but I don't want anybody to know about that. No, your sin is forgiven and covered. The shame has been covered and dealt with. And then look what he says. Blessed is the man through whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in the spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away. And through my groaning all day long, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. When I was silent, I was dying a slow death is what he says. When I was quiet, when nobody knew, I was dying a slow death. But I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. And I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time where you may be found. That is beautiful. When I was silent, I was wasting away. And then I said to myself, I will share my transgression with the Lord. I'll admit it. And you forgave. That's the truth of God's word. Stay in silence, whatever it is. You go, that's not a big deal, Chuck. Yeah, okay. Stay in silent and waste away. You want to experience the freedom of God? You have to speak up. Say to yourself, I will share. I will tell the Lord my transgression. And be confident that he moves in your direction. You know, a year ago, um, about a, two weeks before Easter, um, well, I'll back up. Leading up to last Easter, for about a year, I've been battling with anxiety pretty intensely. I wouldn't tell a lot of people that. There were a handful of people in this church that kind of knew that, that I shared that with. And, and there was a kind of ongoing conversation among the handful of people that we knew. And the handful of conversation was, yeah, you're going to go talk to someone about that eventually. Yeah, 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 I'm going to go talk to someone about that eventually. And, and they would share some of this. Oh, you're going to go talk about that eventually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I found myself over a year consistently meeting with people and being like, hey, are you going to go talk to someone about that? Are you going to get help about that? Are you going to do something intentional in that area? And I'd say, you know, it's real important that we do that. Like, even I have problems and I should do that too. And then they would always ask, so what are you doing about it? And I, I, was, I didn't have an answer. I had no answer. It got embarrassing how often I would challenge someone to, to come out in the open and, and grab onto the family of God and, and get the help that they needed. And, and then I would say, you know, we all should do this. And they go, well, cool, how about you? And, and, I, and I didn't. And my, my way of coping oftentimes was to work out because if I could work out, then working out could kind of take the edge off some of the anxiety and I could sleep at night. I was struggling to sleep a lot. And so the working out would help that. I would work out real hard. If I didn't work out, in fact, I would work out even if I got real sick because it was like a double whammy. If I got sick, then I didn't feel like I could work out. But if I didn't work out, then I couldn't sleep, then I couldn't get better. You know, have you ever, that's a bad cycle. And so I, I couldn't sleep at night, so I kept getting sicker. And then, but then like I, I felt too bad to go to the gym and then the gym helped me go to sleep. And so I got caught myself in this cycle. And I remember one particular time a few weeks before Easter last year, I was, my heart was just racing. And so I cut out whatever I was doing over lunch. I canceled an appointment. I went to the gym. I worked out. I took a shower. Um, and then I got in my car to go to my next appointment. And I was, I was actually, we were over there at the ministry center. And I got out of my car and I, I couldn't catch my breath. I couldn't catch my breath. And I remember realizing if I don't talk to somebody about this, I'm never going to get better. And so I remember I, I was in the parking lot and I pulled out my phone and I messaged somebody who I knew I could trust. Someone had recommended to say, you know, I think this is a trustworthy person. And I messaged that person and I said, hey, I need to talk to somebody. And the person called me in five minutes and started a journey of me coming into the light about some of the things that were causing that anxiety. 
And, and I know, I look back on that year and I think, man, it took me, it took me a, a year, a year of being completely in the dark and unhealthy. How much pride does God have to break through our lives before we say, God, okay, what do you want me to do? And it's not the same thing I did. It's, it may be totally different where you land and what you needed and how you walk with the family of God may be completely different. But gosh, don't take years on end for your pride or your shame or whatever to get in the way from you coming into the freedom God has for you. Does that mean I'm not just anxiety free now? No. But I tell you this, there are things that are unraveling around the idols in my heart that are coming free as I walk in the light about some of those areas. And that's a beautiful, freeing thing. And I think it's the kind of thing God wants all of us to walk in. And so that's kind of the, the point of this service. So I'm gonna pray, and we're gonna respond in worship. And here's what I want us to do. If there's an area of your life, you don't have to say what it is, but if there's something like that battling in you, here's what I would like. I would like for, uh, the, we got this whole row of chairs up here. I'd like you to come and pray. And when you do that, some of my leaders are gonna come up and they're gonna come and they're gonna lay hands on you. And then if you would like when they do that, if you would like to share with them what it is you're battling with, if that would be your first step to say, I do wanna walk in the light about this, then maybe you could look up at the person laying hands on you and you could say, please pray for me about this. That's good because it's accountability. Yes, pray for me, I'm hurting. Okay, here's what you can pray about. And you don't have to, but if you want to, I wanna challenge this, we're a family, we will not be shocked, I promise. So I'm gonna pray and we're gonna respond in worship and let's do that. If you feel led to do that, come forward, go to these chairs and we wanna pray for you. God, we pray that your spirit is working and we pray that there is hope arising in our heart and that there is freedom that you have for us that we have not yet experienced. Pray that we could taste it and see it, and by your grace and the power of the gospel and the cross of Jesus that it's dealt with our shame, help us to grab onto it. In Jesus' name, amen.